to all of you. Um, yeah, I guess I'll just begin. This talk is about lessons learned from building blockchains. So hello again. My name is Aiden Hyman. I'm a co-founder and CEO of Chainsafe Systems. And at Chainsafe, we're a 35-person blockchain research and development firm. Where we really our day-to-day -day is building blockchains. Um, and not just that, but that's mostly what we do. And I'll talk a bit about that today. Um, so for the agenda today, we're going to, and sorry, I'm using an open source presentation, so it's not very sharp. Um, but yeah, so for the agenda today, I'm going to do a brief intro onto Chainsafe and some of the projects we work on. And I'm going to define sustainability, which is really our mission to be a sustainable blockchain research and development firm. And then I'm going to define open source software. And then I'm going to talk a bit about the Linux Foundation, which is really what I think is a perfect example of a sustainable organization that releases open source software. And then I'm going to talk about kind of our response to those lessons learned over the past three years. And then I'm going to conclude the talk with a snappy quote. Um, so just a little bit about Chainsafe. Um, some of the people even in this room are familiar with this meetup. This is the Toronto Ethereum Developers Meetup, a place where I met most of my partners. Um, and really for us, it's really important to never forget where we came from. Um, it's really places like this and you know, community-driven uh, meetups that allowed us to meet each other and come together to understand that you know, we really can do whatever we want. Um, as long as we work together. Uh, and so this was really our first uh, office. Obviously, it's not our office. It's a public library where we used to rent space in a tiny room in the back corner. Um, but that for us, you know, having a public place for us to go to as an organization really was an incredible kind of first step into being a real organization. Um, and obviously, the space was free. Uh, and so this is my partner's uh, apartment building, and this was our second office room, really, was his living room. Um, you know, some of the people here have stayed in that apartment when they've come to visit us in Toronto. Um, and again, you know, it's really important to never forget where we came from. And just to understand how important it is to um, have the right intention and the right beginning to building stuff in the blockchain space because there's just so much hype and so much lack of true intention with what a lot of what we do in the space, unfortunately. Um, so this is an architecture firm, which was honestly our first real office where we could go Monday to Friday, uh, 9 to 5 or later, and just do whatever we wanted. Um, and this was someone that we met through the community that just gave us space and said, hey, you can work had a few desks in our office. Um, and yeah, without that, we wouldn't have had a space at the beginning. And it really let us you know, talk to people and, and take ourselves a little bit more seriously. Um, and so this was our first office. Um, yeah, this is our first office that we paid rent for. Um, it's just next door to the office we are in today. And yeah, it's, uh, it's a good memory for sure. Um, and so this is the Ethereum Developers Meetup now, or at least maybe a year ago, when I took this picture. Um, and yeah, this is now a, a meetup that we help co-organize. So we went from being attendees to being co-organizers. And it's just really important to understand that as people in this space, you know, we, we can take, but we also have to give back. We have to build on the same things that gave us the opportunities to be in positions that we are today. And uh, unfortunately, so much of what our space does is, you know, not necessarily create avenues in which there is space to give back. Um, but, you know, you owe that to your community to start a meetup, to participate in meetups, and to just talk about the work that you do every day. Because without that, there is no community, there is no Ethereum. Uh, so this is us at ETH Waterloo. Um, this is mostly the Toronto crew and a few people that came from out of town. Um, and this was, yeah, a nice kind of picture that we were able to take together. A lot of our team is remote, um, and so this is not, you know, everyone, but it definitely felt good to be able to, to be together in one place. And yeah, there are a few of us wearing these hoodies today, so if you see anyone 
we're not really afraid of hugs, so you can give us a hug. Um, oops. And so yeah, so our motto is very simple. We are building the infrastructure for Web3. When we joined the space, it was really, you know, uh, good intention that brought us there in the first place. And you know, we thought we would go and build all the use cases in the world, and very quickly we realized that infrastructure piece is not there to be able to effectively build the things that people need, the things that we were excited about in the first place. Um, and so very quickly we became, you know, uh, this kind of research and development firm that focused on building critical infrastructure in a way that's blockchain agnostic so that we're able to truly kind of learn from these different protocols and bring those lessons to what we do every single day. Um, and so now I'll just begin talking about the different projects that we have. My talk should only be around 15 minutes, so hopefully there's some time to, to ask questions afterwards. Um, so we'll see how it goes. Maybe it'll be even all quicker or longer. Um, so Lodestar. Lodestar and all of these projects are in the order in which we started working on them. Um, so just to kind of be clear that I'm not playing favorites here. <laughs> um, so Lodestar. Lodestar is a TypeScript implementation of the Beacon Chain and really the entirety of the in-browser ecosystem for ETH 2.0. Um, so we're really proud to be working with the support from the EF on kind of that in-browser ecosystem that will allow developers to really interact with ETH2 in a way that they're used to, so in JavaScript, TypeScript. Um, so it's really important for us and really important for the ecosystem that we ensure that these tools are you know, stable enough for people to actually be able to use them effectively. Uh, so this has kind of put us into this position where we need to be coordinating with the community, working with different people, and understanding what lessons learned they have from ETH1 developer tools. Um, and we're really proud to be in that position to be able to kind of cross-coordinate all of that. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's a really exciting project. and. Yeah, we're soon going to be publicizing the first of the first audit that we've done on a few of the libraries, um, and so we're really proud of that, and we're really excited by the results and what that means for the work that we're doing moving forward. Um, Gossamer. Gossamer is a go -like implementation of the Polkadot host. So it used to be called the Polkadot runtime environment, and this is really a go -like um, the beginnings of a Golang equivalent to a substrate, which is a blockchain framework written in Rust. And the idea of this is that for the Polkadot ecosystem, there's a notion of parachains. And so we're working on ensuring that uh, developers are able to build these parachains in Go, which is a much more user-friendly, or much more widely used language than Rust. Um, so this has been a lot of fun. It uses really cool kind of stuff like Wasm and WebP2P and a lot of these really exciting tools that we believe beyond blockchain are really kind of the future of the internet and the future of programming. So this has been a really exciting project to work on um, because it's you know, a lot more than just blockchain, um, which is something that we're really excited about. You know, working on things that have a lot of kind of hard skills and kind of, I guess, uh, you know, impact on the ecosystems that are outside of just blockchain, while also, of course, impacting the blockchain ecosystem. Um, so ETC support. Um, so we've been and had been working on hard forking uh, Go Ethereum with its uh, previous two hard forks, and currently we've been working on Hyperledger Basu. So for those of you who don't know, Hyperledger Basu is, in my opinion, one of the most sustainable pieces of software in our space, and that's because Hyperledger is maintaining it. And what that means is that we now have a consortium of people ensuring that this piece of software will be maintained forever. So you know, if bad things happen in our ecosystem, we know that through the Linux Foundation and the Hyperledger project, this piece of software will be maintained. And that's huge for our ecosystem, and it's huge for uh, just you know taking our uh, software seriously. And so I, I don't think we appreciate enough what that means and what the impact that can have on large corporations, new projects, and just people in general. 
um, being comfortable with Ethereum and being comfortable with utilizing the software. Um, so yeah, it's uh, something that makes me extremely proud because, like I said, I believe it's the most sustainable piece of software in our space because of that. So Ethernet and Airtrain. So Ethernet is uh, Ethereum on Tandem and using the Cosmos SDK. So what we've done is create, created a module for the Cosmos SDK um, that is the EVM. And what Ethernet is is an eventual zone that will allow for a proof-of-stake EVM-based blockchain to exist. And so that's super exciting for a lot of different reasons. And with Aragon, what they're looking to do is allow for a native blockchain to support their mission. And so we've been working closely with them to build out Aragon chain, chain um, and to kind of, yeah, utilize Ethermint and work on Ethermint as we're doing this. So it's been an incredible opportunity to not just build a blockchain or components of a blockchain, but to also build on top of it while we're working on it. Um, so, you know, we're constantly able to learn from it. We're constantly able to take those lessons and those kind of, um, I guess, pains that we're going through and have that directly impact the work that we're then doing on kind of the original code, which is Ethernet. And so, yeah, these are the kinds of things that like working on use cases with our, our code that allow us to really improve and to really take what we're doing beyond just our own conceptual understanding of things and to see what the impact will be once we build a use case on top of it. Um, and so this is the latest project that we've been working on, which is a Rust uh, implementation of Filecoin. And so this is a really exciting project, firstly, because it's one that I can explain to people and they can just understand. <laughs> you know, we're taking extra storage and we're putting stuff on it. You know, anyone can relate to this project, anyone can understand this project, because that's the first thing people think when we talk about mining in Ethereum or just mining in general or blockchains. Um, but this project actually looks to solve a huge problem, um, which is distributed file store and decentralized file store. So those of you familiar with IPFS, this is really creating an incentivized, um, uh, an incentivized version of that that really allows for it to scale in a way that's also safe for users and safe for developers. Um, and so you, know, you can imagine uh, you know, an open source, decentralized, distributed DAP being able to be deployed very soon, which is extremely exciting and extremely empowering to developers all over the world. Um, and so just to talk about sustainability, um, sustainability is the ability to exist constantly, according to Wikipedia at least. Um, and so this is really important to note because when talking about sustainability, it's almost contradictory to the notion of constant growth, right? It's not just about constant growth, but doing so in a measured way. You can be constantly growing, but you have to do so in a way that allows for you to grow in a way that doesn't take away from your future abilities to uh, exist in a stable way. So this is really important because for us, you know, we've bootstrapped everything we've done uh, from the beginning for three years, and sustainability has been what has allowed us to do that. Understanding that there is no uh, there is no opportunity in just growing beyond what you can actually um, handle for the sake of it. Um, and so for us, it's been an important kind of, uh, an important thing that has kept us grounded, always understanding that, you know, we've done this through hard work and investing in our own technical understanding of things as opposed to buying a bunch of youth and holding it. Holding it. Um, and so to talk a bit about open source software, um, this is from the Linux Foundation. And so there's three criteria that define open source software according to the Linux Foundation. And so number one, it is available in, in source code form without charge or at a cost. And number two, open source may be modified and redistributed without additional permission. And number three, finally other criteria may apply to its use in redistribution. So the third one is a bit ambiguous, but the first two are pretty clear. Um, what it means to be open source software. And so when we take 
uh, open source software and sustainability, I believe that's where blockchains really found, find themselves in. Um, because we're not necessarily creating platforms in a Web 2.0 context. What we're doing is creating things that are reliant on a sustainable growth. Or, you know, we have the ICO bubble that we saw, and really that didn't take us too far. Um, and so looking at the platinum sponsors of the Linux Foundation, the people that make the most widely used open source software work, and the ones that are funding this incredible work, um, are competitors. People who aren't friends, people who hate each other, people whose entire lives revolves around this understanding of a, uh, yeah, of pure zero-sum economics, but somehow they decided that it makes sense for them financially to sponsor something like Linux. And this is something that's truly important. And it kind of brings me to uh, a huge lesson learned, or the most important one, I think, for us from a business sense, which is if we're not able to get competitors to see value beyond zero-sum thinking, we will lose. When looking at Linux and what made it so successful is that they were able to get literal competitors to understand that there isn't just zero sum in everything they do. Rather the opposite, that economic cooperation leads to incredible uh, advantages in each and every one of their businesses. And again, going back, it's absolutely ridiculous to think that all of these people could work together. Um, but they did, and it works. And so our response to that and learning from these different things is chain bridge v2. So originally we had a, a bridge that allowed for EVM-based blockchains to uh, interoperate with one another. Um, but now we've been working with support from three projects, which will soon allow us to bridge um, Ethereum-based chains, Ethereum Classic, Cosmos, and Polkadot. Um, and so what that means with Cosmos and Polkadot is uh, right now it works with Ethereum but eventually we'll have a uh, native Cosmos SDK module. And for Polkadot, it's an SRML that we have right now experimentally working. So an SRML is a subject, uh, it's a substrate uh, library. Um, and so this is kind of a very basic demo of it that my uh, co-founder Greg worked on, our CTO, just to show us on Slack. And I decided, okay, I'll just put it in there presentation because I'm really proud of it. I'm sorry, on my laptop it looks a lot better. <laughs> but basically you can see that validators have, uh, have approved a transaction after it was sent over, and so it says finalized over there. But yeah, again, I apologize. But yeah, you can see that the balance has changed and everything. Um, and so this is EVM to EVM. Um, but yeah, like I said, experimentally it's working with a subtrade based chain and uh, Ethernet as well. So this is something we're extremely proud of because we have three different projects working on three different chains funding the development of this work. And so this is the beginning of us moving towards a much more sustainable approach to the stuff that we built. And so they saw, and all these projects know that they're funding the same piece of software just with different nuances that make sense for them. Um, and so this is extremely exciting because, again, Sustainability is what will lead us to mass adoption, not insane speculation and a ridiculous, um, yeah, whatever we saw in 2017. It clearly didn't work. Um, and so, to conclude on all of this, um, I don't know how long I took, but I'm pretty sure. Um, without learning the history of open source, it is easy to think that good intention is what has fueled this movement, when in reality, the fuel for this movement is economic cooperation. It's important to understand that people working together is what allowed for open source software to flourish. It's not this notion of I will build everything myself and I will do all and capture the entirety of the market. Um, it's really important that if you take any way or anything away from my talk, it's that economic cooperation is what will lead us to mass adoption because that will allow us to sustain beyond just another bubble or another three bubbles like we've seen in blockchain. Um, and that's really important to understand when designing projects, when just going and fundraising even, 
you know, it is important to see this as a 10-year um, kind of journey as opposed to, you know, six months, and I can build it all in six months. Um, so yeah, if you want to say hi, or just tell me something I said was offensive, please send me an email um, at aiden, aiden at tradesafe.io. Um, our GitHub is there. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Does anyone have any questions? I know I have a lot of time, so if not, I'll be really quick, so please ask a question. The question was, what is the state of blockchain agnosticism? And I believe it is flourishing more than it ever has. And it is because we're starting to understand that we need to work together. Um, so something like libp2p, for example, is a perfect example of that. Um, projects that previously created their own networking stack are now looking at migrating to libp2p. Because without seeing that we can kind of work on these mutually beneficial components, um, you're left to have to maintain everything yourself. And that does not scale well when dealing with millions of users, potentially. I say potentially, because we haven't proven that yet. Um, but I believe that we're more than ever starting to take you know, things like cryptographic primitives that other projects are working on in a much more serious way. And we're seeing that through the IP process and through different kind of things in our space. Um, but yeah, I believe more than ever this is the right time for economic cooperation because that is what allows blockchains to exist in the first place. It's an economic cooperation between developers, miners, slash validators, um, users, and m maybe even speculators. Um, but if we don't find ourselves in a sweet spot of all of those stakeholders, uh, there's just no way that we will succeed. And, you know, what is more important, the success of the space or the financial success of an individual? And um, I think that that's something a lot of people have to ask themselves and take very seriously. Any more questions? Okay, thank you so much. Excuse me, I'm still warming up at the system.